establishment of the communist uh, enclave in Yan'an. Is that where we left off last time, I think, I believe? Yeah. Where I am? Yeah. Okay. I covered the Long March. Yes. Yeah. Right. And the United Front against the Japanese, which the, uh, was established in 1937 with the kidnapping. Remember, Chang was kidnapped and was forced to sign an agreement with the communists that they would cooperate against the Japanese. But everyone knew that it was temporary, that the reckoning would come after the Japanese were defeated. Now, is there any question up to that point? Anything I could clarify before we start? All right. Okay. During the war <coughs> against the Japanese, began in 1937. The Japanese had invaded Manchuria in 32, established a puppet state, as you know. But the real fight, the real invasion didn't begin until 37. There was an incident that served as a pretext. Uh, nationalist troops clashed with Japanese troops at the Marco Polo Bridge in northern China and a full-scale invasion began in 1937. So actually today, this day, December the 9th, is the 82nd anniversary of the Japanese uh, invasion of Nanking. This is one of the most horrendous episodes in the 20th century, in a century of barbarism. And this is one of the worst. It's estimated that Japanese soldiers were just given permission to do whatever they liked. And what they ended doing was murdering 300,000 Chinese civilians in cold blood. Horrendous episode. There's a very good book by a woman named Iris Chang called The Rape of Nanking. She herself, a Chinese American, committed suicide uh, a few years later. I don't know, you know whether researching the book led to a permanent depression of some kind, but she was a, a suicide later on. So the full-scale war begins. 1937, uh, in, and not ending till 45. Now in the course of the war, the American public we, of course, have a great degree of sympathy with the Chinese. In 41, when the war began between the United States and Japan after Pearl Harbor, that was four years after the uh, war started in China, the uh, Roosevelt this, and Churchill had a meeting and they decided that in this war against the, the Axis, because Japan had signed an agreement of, with Germany and so on, that in this war it would be the, the Europe first. In other words, all the resources, most of the resources, would be concentrated on the European theater. That it was necessary to fight the war in Europe. That, sh that the war in the Pacific would come after. As aside from some degree of uh, you know, funding and so on, advisors, the British, of course, were involved also in the war against Japan because days after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese invaded, uh, took Singapore. You know that famous story, the guns of Singapore were turned to the you know, to north instead of toward the sea. And uh, the, the two of the great, uh, the, the Prince of Wales, and then, you know, a, a great battleship, the pride of the British fleet, was sunk by air, by Japanese air force, which was unprecedented, that you could sink a ship of the size of the Prince of, the, uh, Prince of Wales uh, by air, air uh, craft. So that's another story. Well, we're going to stick with China then for a little bit. And what I want to do is talk about 
the event, uh, very quickly, the events of the war in China. Because really, in a sense, you had two governments. In the north, the communists were expanding Yan'an, their base in Yan'an. They had established that after the Long March, and it grew during the war. It grew because Mao Zedong understood certain things about uh, warfare. He understood that the great bulk of the population were peasants, and that if you could mobilize the peasants, you would have an impregnable base. And you had to treat the peasants with respect. You couldn't rob them. You couldn't mistreat them. That would be the base. He understood that. And then, of course, unknown in the North, but the, the book by Edgar Snow, which I mentioned last time, it is truly one of the most influential books of the century. No question. <clears throat> it's been translated into numerous languages. Snow himself, as I mentioned to you before, was a great admirer of Mao oh. and of the other leaders. He often went out with the Red Army in the north on their various campaigns. So he became an expert in the tactics of a peasant-oriented army. And he admired it. He saw that they were honest, that they had, in fact, the interests of the peasants at heart, and he wrote a glowing tribute. He could have been uh, Mao's publicist. That book played an enormous role in the 20th century. It was published in numerous languages. Snow himself became a, a, a major celebrity. And to this day, that book remains in print. It is a guide to guerrilla warfare. Mm -hmm. It guided uh, guerrilla warfare in Africa, in Asia. If you, uh, they found copies of the book in the possession of the Golden Path guerrillas in Peru 30 or 40 years ago. It's a how-to book. And just to get a little bit ahead, when the war ended and there was a hysteria in the United States over who lost China, and I'll get into that very shortly, Snow found that he could not uh, get a job. So <clears throat> he uh, went back to Europe, I think, I don't remember, I have it here somewhere, but anyhow, Mao sent his personal physicians. He was suffering from pancreatic cancer. And Mao sent his personal physicians to treat him because they held him in such esteem and such respect. It became a kind of Bible to revolutionary movements all over the world, especially the kind of a revolution that Mao had led, a revolution that did not come in classical terms from factory workers, from proletarians overthrowing the bourgeoisie, but, but from peasants. And I think if you look at Mao's own philosophy, let's see if, yeah. This is what Mao said during the march in 27. In a very short time, in China's central, southern, and northern provinces, several hundred million peasants will rise like a mighty storm, like a hurricane, a force so swift and violent that no power, however great, will be able to hold it back. That was now in March of 27. Mm -hmm. And in 1919, in an article he wrote, what is the greatest question in the world? The greatest question is that of getting food to eat. What is the greatest force? The greatest force is that of the union of the popular masses. And so this is the great truth that he had latched onto.
class, this is 1949, after they had come to power. <clears throat> Classes struggle. Some classes triumph. Others are eliminated. <clears throat> Such is history. <clears throat> Such is the history of civilization for thousands of years. That was <clears throat> Asia, <clears throat> excuse me. Asia's revolution would not come from the middle classes, from the bourgeois. There weren't enough of them. It would come from the peasant masses. And revolutionaries in South America, in Africa, latched onto that feeling. <coughs> Vietnam, the uh, truth that he latched onto was that the peasants were not some inert mass, but they could be <coughs> energized and become the greatest revolutionary force in the world. So, all right, now, <coughs> let me go on from there. In uh, the United States plan, and from the beginning was Europe first, that we would send aid to uh, Chiang, advisors, uh, you know, Stilwell went to help shape up the army, didn't had a terrible time with uh, Chiang, whom he identified as waiting it out, let the Americans fight it out. After the war, we'll have to fight the communists. So the, uh, it was America first. Madame Chang came to the United States in 1943. She wanted to change Roosevelt's mind. Not America, uh, Europe first, but she wanted it to be Asia first. She wanted the aid, the major aid, to come to, to uh, China rather than to Europe. And she arrived in Washington in November of 1942. <clears throat> There is a new book that was published this week. It's called, I have the name of it, Red Sister, Big Sister, Little Sister. Just published by uh, a author, I had it listed here, so Jung Chang. She wrote a very popular biography of uh, Mao Zedong. This is about the three Song sisters. Red Sister, that was, Sun Yat-sen's widow. She, beca she, was a, uh, she became converted to communism and remained uh, so until her death in 1981. Big sister was, uh, I think, no, not Eileen, was the middle sister. She mar married one of the richest industrialists in China, H. H. Kung. <coughs> Little sister was Mei Ling, Chiang Kai-shek's wife. And they were Christian. They were very close to what I would call the missionary um, element, very powerful. The, uh, the missionaries had played, American missionaries had played a very important role in China in the 19th century. I mentioned Pearl Buckley, who began life as a missionary in China. Uh, they played a very significant role within Chinese life. And there was a missionary complex in the United States as well. Henry Luce, who owned Life and Time magazine, was uh, a son of missionaries. They had a very strong, powerful interest. Chiang Kai-shek, when he married uh, Mei Ling was converted to Christianity, and the ceremony was widely hailed, and so on. She arrives in Washington in November of 42 and addresses Congress. And she tells Congress in this speech that it is more important to defeat Japan than Germany, that we are two great allies together. Now, at the speech, congressmen were seen weeping, crying. She goes to visit uh, Roosevelt, tries to persuade him to change the policy. She addresses Congress. I'll just give you some idea of the reception this woman received and of, of the way in which Americans thought of her. This is Mrs. Roosevelt speaking. A great person receiving the recognition due her 
as an individual valiantly fighting in the forefront of the world's battle. This, this, this is from newspapers. The greatest man in Asia is a woman. <laughs> the real brains and boss of the Chinese government. A fabulous woman, a legend of fearlessness, beauty, and wisdom hard to believe. <clears throat> uh, the Cincinnati Times Star, an almond-eyed Cleopatra. <clears throat> she was a very beautiful woman. <clears throat> Wendell Wilkie, you remember the name, you remember the president. The wife of China's Generalissimo is the only international celebrity whose personal attractiveness far exceeds her advance notices. Claire Booth Luce. Madame Chang is the greatest living woman. Elsa Maxwell. Ms. Madame Chang is one of the greatest women the world, in the world who will go down in history as the mother of modern China. Not a prediction that worked out too well. Okay. <clears throat> Life magazine. Probably the most powerful woman in the world. Chang and Madame Chang, China's George and Martha Washington. <laughs> and so it went. <clears throat> China has now the most, this is a uh, time, China has now the most enlightened, patriotic, and able rulers in her history. It goes on and on. When she was hospitalized, <clears throat> briefly, she received a thousand letters a day from admirers. The State Department code for her was Snow White. <laughs> this is how they described her speech to Congress. A little slim figure in Chinese dress. A dramatic entrance as she walked down the aisle surrounded by tall men. Long tight-fitting black gown, <coughs> skirt slit to the knee. The chamber fairly shook with applause. She was idolized as a great heroine <coughs> beyond all semblance of reality. So when the war ended and the Chinese rejected Chang and Madame, it was a shock it was a psychological earthquake to many Americans. The Russians had a different view. This is what they said about her. This is the, the uh, NKVD records. An active woman with a will of steel, very aggressive and arrogant, a <coughs> mixture of authoritarianism, selfishness, fake liberalism, and charitable activities to conceal her reactionary uh, achievements. <laughs> they got it right. <laughs> a wave. Well, I cite all this because Americans were living in a, in a delusion. Had no idea whatever of what was happening in China. I never heard, people who read Edgar Snow's book knew about Mao, but that this, uh, the United States was not, you know, the chief, um, they were not the chief readers of the book, didn't follow it. There were other events to follow in Europe and so on. So the war ended, and I must say though, during the war, we had a number of very smart State Department experts on China, in China. <coughs> and several times, they knew what was happening in the North, and several times, uh, various of these experts went up to Yan'an to see what was happening. They were aware, you know, Edgar Snow, and they knew exactly, they knew how corrupt the nationalists were. I read you excerpts from Stilwell, who was sent to uh, take charge of several uh, uh, units in Chang's army, and he got no cooperation. He understood that they were waiting, they were holding out. They knew the war would, would end. The United States would see to that. 
And when the war ended, they had to steel themselves for the war that was coming. There was a war coming. And they knew it would be the final confrontation. Uh, Chiang had had a united front with the communists in 27. And he had turned on them, remember the massacres in Shanghai, when Mao escaped to the south. And he knew it wasn't over, that it was coming again. He understood that. So why fight the Japanese when the Americans will do it? And he'll be sitting pretty when the war ends. That was, well, a number of American agents, uh, State Department employees, went up to Yan'an to see what was happening there. And they sent back reports in 1944. We know all this because after the war was over, and the shock of shocks, suddenly a civil war had broken out in China and in 1949, Chiang was gone and the communists had taken over. How could this have happened? How could this possibly have happened? And so the, the, it must be that there were, were communist agents at work in Washington subverting the government and secretly working in behalf of the Russians and the Chinese communists. This was the Great Red Scare after World War II. You probably remember the McCarthy era. You remember that, I'm sure, read about it, whatever. In order to prove that the United States had done everything to prop up Chiang and keep him in the war, the State Department, I think it was Dean Acheson, decided that they would open the archives and publish them. Well, it was unprecedented. I brought one volume. It was called The China White Paper, August 1949. The United States relations with China with special reference to the period 1944-49. So they issued, unprecedented to issue documents this was issued uh, in 49, and it went back to about 41 or 42. And what that we discovered reading these documents was that there were a number of reports that were sent to the federal government describing the actual situation in China. For example, this is a... a, a Davies, there were several of uh, Davies service. They were uh, State Department agents in, uh, representatives in China, intelligence officers. Davies on November the 7th, 1944, this is what he said. The Chinese communists are so strong between the Great Wall and the Yangtze that they now can look forward to the post-war control of at least North China. The communists have survived 10 years of civil war and seven years of Japanese war. They have survived not only more sustained enemy pressure than the Chinese central government, but also a severe blockade imposed by Chiang. They have survived and they have grown. Communist growth has been almost geometric in progression. From control of 100,000 square kilometers with a population of one million and a half, they have expanded to about 850,000 square kilometers with a population of 90 million, and they will continue to grow. The reason for this vitality is simple. It is mass support, mass participation. The communist governments are the first in modern Chinese history to have widespread popular support. They have this support because the governments and armies are genuinely of the people. <clears throat> they go, and there are others. I mean, report after report comes in from the agents of the in the field. This is by Robert Service. Just as the Japanese army cannot crush these militant people, now, so also will Guomindang force fail in the future. With this great popular base, the communists cannot be eliminated. 
and he describes why. Chiang cannot succeed. The communists are already too, uh, too strong for him. If the Generalissimo precipitates a civil war, he will be confronted with defeat. Chiang's feudal China cannot long coexist alongside a dynamic popular government in North China. The communists are in China to stay, and China's destiny is not Chiang's, but theirs. 1944. What do you think happened to these officials after the war? All discharged. The crime was telling the truth. But you see, after the war was over, the American public was, we sent General Marshall to try to arrange some kind of a, uh, a, a truce, a coalition between the communists. He went to China and he, uh, Mao came from the north, Chang, they met, Marshall attempted, and he was one of the great soldiers in American history, as you know, a great Secretary of State. He attempted to put together some kind of a truce, some kind of a coalition. Could not do it. Both of them knew that the mandate of heaven was passing. They knew that it was do or die. This was the moment. One would survive. There would be no coalitions. And so he left. He advised against American intervention. There was actually some support for American intervention in the Chinese Civil War. One writer has said, Marshall spared us a super Vietnam. Imagine attempting to intervene in a situation like this. And so he advised Truman that there was no, there was no, there was no way of a coalition, there was no uh, compromise that could be reached. The communists knew that they would win. Chiang still clung to the, the hope that somehow he could pull it out. War was inevitable. The American public was completely baffled. How could the Chinese reject this wonderful woman? <laughs> I read you what we thought of her. The whole picture of the war was completely distorted. When the war ended, this was the condition. Let's see, there were results of the war. Okay, let me just describe. Okay. The Chinese army, this is by a um, uh, army intelligence. In the final Japanese offensive, the Nationalists lost 700,000 troops, 146 uh, trucks, 100,000 square miles of territory with 60 million people in seven months. Ineffective. The Chinese army at the end of the war, this is how it was described, a pulp, a tired, dispirited, unorganized mass, despised by the enemy, alien to its own people, neglected by its government, and ridiculed by its allies. The communist government, a collection, uh, the soldiers are disciplined, highly organized, motivated. Small corps squads are headed by CP members, indoctrination extensive. A collection of guerrilla bands has become a centralized, conventional, <coughs> professional army. The Communist Army in 37 composed of 50,000, in 1945, 500,000. As the war ended, they controlled one-fifth of the Chinese population. <coughs> Later, uh, a Japanese visitor to Mao apologized for the Japanese invasion. And Mao said to him, instead of your apologizing to me, perhaps I should thank you, because without Certainly without the, um, the Japanese invasion, this whole history would have probably been different. Also, when the Japanese army, with the Million Man Army in Manchukuo, surrendered, surrendered to the Russians, all the equipment of that Million right. Man Army was given to Mao. Yeah, that's right. Also, the, the communists 
also seized a great deal of American equipment from um, uh, the Ch China. It's interesting that when Mao rolled into Beijing, he rolled in on an American tank. <laughs> His soldiers were all equipped with American arms. The nationalists had run away, abandoned the arms, and a lot of the equipment, as you said, was given them by the Russians, and we had given it to the Russians. So, all right. <clears throat> So when, the war ends the in the war, United States. When did the Civil War end? What date? Or what, I can't hear you. When did the Civil War end? Officially, yeah, 49. When, when in 49? Uh, when, it, what month? Uh, October 1st. In October 49. October 49. So in October 49, <clears throat> the Civil War ended. In and China. The, in China. And the Korean <laughs> War began in June of 50. Six months later. Exactly. Six, seven months later. Exactly. Eight months later. Exactly. Because by 49, <clears throat> what you had was a raging debate in the United States. You had the McCarthy era beginning. Mm -hmm. Who lost China? That was the debate. It must be that there were Russian agents uh, who subverted. China. It must be, it was the Great Red Scare that began right after the war. The Russian, you, look, didn't Churchill refer to the Iron Curtain before the war was even over? An Iron Curtain is descending. Churchill even contemplated leaving German troops armed to fight the Russians as they moved into, uh, that was, dis that thought was discarded, but it's there on paper. So, and this was an extension of the Cold War. And in the United States, you had the McCarthy era when who lost China was the great national. People were fired from their positions. Uh, I know that uh, in the universities, uh, a, a great number of scholars lost their jobs. These people who reported accurately <laughs> were fired. No one could ex uh, explain how could this have happened. Partly it was the result of this build up during the war. That was Roosevelt's view. Build up Chang. In 43, Roosevelt, Churchill, and Chang held a conference in Cairo, the big three. You remember Stilwell referred to him as the peanut. That was the big three. It was a, a distortion of reality. But nevertheless, that was, Chang would be our person, you know, our ally in the Pacific. He would take care of the Pacific area for us. They had no idea of what was coming. And as far as these, uh, these people were all fired after the war. They were communist agents. They couldn't be believed. They were undermining Ma uh, Chang. How is it possible for such a wonderful man and his wonderful wife to have been rejected by their people? It's interesting that when the, the uh, uh, Chang soldiers, mainly, they had moved into the big cities, especially those in the Yangtze Valley and along the coast. And as the communists began to move down from the north, there wasn't even much fighting. There's one description of the changeover in Shanghai. People went to bed at night and they looked out of the window and there were nationalist soldiers guarding the area. When they woke up in the morning, and there were still soldiers guarding the area, but they weren't nationalists, they were communist soldiers. <laughs> what had happened? Somehow during the night, the nationalists had just kind of slunk away, and the communists had taken their place. Wasn't even that much fighting in the big cities. So in traditional Chinese terms, the mandate had passed. When the mandate passes, you know it. You affirm the passing of the mandate. It is. And to fight for a lost cause made no sense. Chang, as you know, went off to for, uh, Taiwan. It was then the Japanese island Formosa. They evacuated to uh, Taiwan, and the communists consolidated their hold over the mainland. And in the United States, there was a fearful battle over who lost China. A fearful battle. The Korean War, in a sense, comes very soon after. Again, there's fear, the communists, uh, actually Korea, you know, we had given the Russians all kinds of inducements to get into the war against Japan. And one of them was uh, territory in Manchuria that had belonged to China, and an inducement to move through on their way to, uh, 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 I guess, attack Japan. So Korea had been, I guess, a peninsula 
that was in the direct path of the uh, purported invasion of Japan, and so the Russians had, in a sense, moved in. And the whole war against Korea was, in fact, a fear in the United States that communism was expanding and it had to be stopped. MacArthur, at one point, as you probably remember, had ventured very close to the Chinese border in North Korea. And he was uh, secretly advising Truman to use an atom bomb on China because the Chinese had responded by sending in troops. And the troops were extremely effective. They drove the United States, for, you know, very far, it, it inflicted big losses on the United States and drove us down to the, uh, is it the 50th parallel? Oh, okay. Anyhow, the Chinese, uh, here we were actually fighting the Chinese. Chinese took a large number of prisoners. Some of them at the end of the war elected to stay in China. I think 25 or 30 elected to stay in China. So we were not only uh, absolutely, you know, flummoxed by the, the communist success, but in addition to that, you had actual warfare between the United States and China in Korea. And so a deep freeze, in a sense, uh, settled over the relationship. And in the United States, this question of who lost China really riled the public. It was fought in the newspapers, on the radio, certain figures rose to prominence, uh, but uh, the idea of our, uh, in any way, uh, expecting a rapprochement with China seemed extremely far-fetched, especially after actually engaging them in war in Korea. Okay, we're up to 51. All right, now I'm going to go back. Now I'm going to tell you about what Mao did in China. And then, did, all right. China, did China, Mao, think that Korea was part of China? Is that why they got involved? No, Korea had never been part of China. So why did, but he, why did he want to fight there then? Because they thought there was an invasion of China coming. We had got, gotten very close to the border with China. And they were convinced that the American troops would not stop at the border, that they would be so hostile to uh, China. They were convinced that that was a possibility. So they moved in to avert the possibility. Also, Korea has always had a very special place in Chinese life. It was the number one tributary state. You know, in the old uh, uh, world of Man Manchu China, the, Korea was the eldest son in the system, and, a very, and right on their border. So obviously, they moved in, uh, and MacArthur suggested the atom bomb be used on China, and Truman fired him at that point because he understood that, you know, we had just finished fighting Germany and now we didn't want another major confrontation. All right, Mao has now arrived. The mandate of heaven has passed. There is a new son of heaven, all right? And Mao is the undisputed ruler. What policy do they begin to, internal policy? And I'm gonna see if I can do it very quickly. First, uh, uh, incidentally, Mao knew uh, how to read, had people who could read English, and they read the China White Paper also, and they found out through the White Paper how much effort, money, munitions, everything else that the United States had lavished on Chiang, how they had, in a sense, been almost participants in the Civil War themselves. So uh, he drew, uh, logical conclusions from that. All right, now, the, um, within China, the first, uh, the first years of, of uh, Chinese communist rule, Mao enters Peking, as I said, in 1949. Befuddled Americans don't know what to make of it. The Maoist state now is established, and I'm going to do this very quickly. Incidentally, I might say, I've been teaching this for years and years. <laughs> and when I was teaching at Penn State, this was 1973. Uh, I clipped this out of the Inquirer, so here it is. And let me just read a little bit. Speaking about, they call them the China hands, the ones who predicted that 
Mao is going to win, so why are we backing a loser? Got fired for that bit of wisdom. And this is the inquiry. This is February the 5th, 1973. About 3,000 persons, including present and former members of the Foreign Service, assembled the other day at the State Department to honor a group of men who had suffered the consequences of having been prematurely right a generation ago. The men were an elite group of Foreign Service officers, old China hands. Many of them had been born in China, raised there, could speak the language. During World War II, they ranged the country and reported back to the State Department with accurate assessments of the real situation. But when what they had predicted came to pass and the Chiang Kai-shek government collapsed of its own weight of corruption and the communists took over the mandate of heaven, these American Foreign Service officers were accused of having plotted it all. The hysterical cry of the day was, who lost China? The answer was that Chiang had lost China, that it had never been ours to lose. Instead of accepting the truth and going on from there, this nation persecuted the men who had reported the truth. They were hounded from the State Department as security risks, or if they could have managed to hang on, they were assigned elsewhere. Theirs was not merely a personal tragedy. The consequences were felt elsewhere. Foreign Service officers watched their language and tried not to report information, however accurate, that might cause them trouble. The service lost men who, had they stayed and risen to their level, might have helped keep this country from the folly of Vietnam. Relations with the People's Republic of China were poisoned for years to come. Now a president of the U.S. has journeyed to Peking. And you know, of course, that that was Richard Nixon. The men who told the truth have been vindicated by history and policy. Yet, as historian Barbara Tuckman declared at the luncheon, it could have happened 25 years earlier, sparing us in Asia immeasurable harm. We cannot know what might have been in history, but we can resolve not to let it happen again. That honest government officials are penalized for their honesty, their patriotism impugned, or that sound policy be held hostage to hysteria. That was a long time later, yeah. but... That can't happen now. <laughs> that can't happen now. Do, do the Chinese still believe that the communists have the world of Confucian is right there? The Confucian? Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of... Uh, Xi Jinping promotes Confucianism. In China because, today. Yeah, I'll talk about that next week. Today. Today. Because the mandate of heaven, that's the phrase I was looking for. Do they think the mandate of heaven yeah. is now with the Chinese communists? Still? Or, what? I can't hear this. Do what they think the mandate of heaven is still with the Chinese communists? Today? I, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Not only has it fallen on them, but it's growing. It's growing. The mandate is growing. There are certain things you can't expunge from people. You cannot expunge 2,000 years of history, custom, practice. So the notion of a mandate of heaven, of the central kingdom, I think it's in the blood. Then there's no way that it'll ever We can't understand it unless we understand that historical connection. Do you, I mean, the communists did everything they could to expunge the previous 2,000 years of what they called feudalism. In the end, they couldn't really do it. They really couldn't do it. Okay, let me just, I want to very quickly describe Mao's policies. That, Mao, that Mao's regime killed more people than any other regime in history. Uh, something like 70 million. I may be off by a few million here and there. Could, could you, when did this happen? All right, let me, that's what I was coming to, right? Okay. Now. All right. <laughs> the Maoist state, in other words. The first 10 years, 49 to, let's say, 49 to 50, 55 or so. Economic recovery. They got a lot of assistance from the Russians. Technological assistance, scientific assistance. Now it's true 
that a number of landlords were killed because land was essentially redistributed to peasants. Peasants now had their own plots. So it meant the landlords had to go. Maybe a million. Land was then redistributed. Agriculture was collectivized, but basically within the collective, peasants you know, had their own plots and so on. Very slow movement. In 1955, things were looking good enough that Mao announced a campaign, it was called the 100 Flowers Campaign, 1955-56. Let 100 flowers bloom. Let 100 points of view be expressed. So we're going to open up the press, open up meetings, say what's on your mind. We want to learn from the people. Well, there was a lot of criticism when the 100 flowers began to bloom. People got up, oh, we can complain? Okay, I've got some complaints to voice. It was a crescendo of complaints, because everything wasn't going as smoothly as they had hoped. Well, Mao was shocked by the reaction. Instead of payons of praise, he was getting a lot of knocks. So they decided at that point, we had, they launched something called the anti-rightist movement as people that were expressing negative thoughts, the hundred flowers weren't blooming properly for them, they would have to be purged. Members of the party would be purged. That would mean being sent off to a distant farm or put in jail or whatever. But they started the purge in 1956 after the hundred flowers. He was truly shocked. He thought it would be all... And then he realized they hadn't gone far enough. That the agricultural um, redistribution of land really wasn't far, hadn't gone far enough, that they were not producing enough capital to invest in big industry as he planned. He now introduced something that the Russians tried in the 1920s. He called it the Great Leap Forward. This is when we overtake the capitalist West. You now move the farmers off the, the land in the collectives, and you set up these huge people's communes. On the commune, the farmer becomes a, a paid employee. He plows the land, but he does it not as, an, as, a, um, as the owner of the plot or even within the village, but now as a, a, a small cog in a big, big operation. These great huge communes are created so that people will work as members of the commune, but they have no private plots. They will also build steel furnaces on the communes. So after you spend all day working on the plot, then at night you can go home and work in the furnace. Isn't that a happy way of life? Background furnaces. What results from this campaign? It's called the Great Leap Forward. Same thing happened in Russia in the 1920s, as you may recall. What happens is a famine, because they're not very good at producing. Uh, they bring a lot of city people who are now extraneous, put them into the communes. They have to start working on the land, and then at night they can make steel also. A devastating famine, this is what you're talking about, 30 million is estimated died in the course of that famine. 30 million. They didn't really know what they were doing half the time. For example, there was a campaign to kill all the sparrows because the sparrows uh, apparently were eating the wheat. But the sparrows also have a very useful function in that, if there's anyone here who knows anything about agriculture, they transfer grain, I guess, drop it on the ground and it grows, I don't know. Anyhow, every sparrow in China was executed. <laughs> then they had to import sparrows when they figured it out, that this was not a very good way to go. Things were so devastating, they tried to keep it quiet, but things were so devastating that now uh, had to relinquish day-to-day -day control. The, the program, the Great Leap Forward, was like the Russian agricultural reforms in the 1920s mm -hmm. that again unleashed massive starvation, millions dying. Think about the, how the bodies are piling up. 
in, through the 19th and 20th centuries. He now relinquishes leadership to Liu Shouji, second in command. And apparently, uh, things, they begin to uh, dismantle the communes. They begin to restore some kind of normal order. Mao is now in the shadows. He's had to give his, the great helmsman as he was known, has had to give over his, uh, you know, it's always, it's, it's really so ironic. Mao was a poet. He wrote beautiful poetry. I had a couple examples here, but I guess I can't find them. <laughs> he wrote, well, oh yeah, I'll just give you a little short sample of Mao's poetry. In 1930, his wife was arrested by the Guomindang and his sister and executed. So he had four wives, but uh, the last one was the very active one in the Gang of Four. But all right, the, this was an earlier wife. And he wrote a, com a letter to a comrade who had also lost his wife. My, this is the letter. And I just give it to you to show the contrast. The great helmsman, responsible for 30 million deaths because of this crazy scheme that they implemented, and a, a poet. My proud poplar is lost to me, and to you, your willow. Poplar and willow soar to the highest heaven. Oh, that's, you know, a very a touching little yeah. two lines of verse, and it's very touching. This was the same man who was responsible for 30 million deaths by starvation. Just extraordinary. <clears throat> However, he's in the shadow briefly now, and in 1966, this is uh, five or six years after the collapse of the, the Great Leap Forward and the terrible death numbers. He launches, he wants to come back in the limelight, and he launches something called the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. 1966. The re he, he became concerned the revolution should be an ongoing thing. It should never end. People should be, you know, participating in revolution Every day, they can't sit back and enjoy bourgeois comforts. They have to be on the go. So he now introduces this concept of a cultural revolution. Now imagine if they closed every junior high in the country and gave each student a railroad pass and some money and said, fan out over the country and do your best, rather do your worst. Confront people. You're in a classroom. The teacher isn't doing a proper job. Confront the teacher. Put the teacher at the back of the room and you teach the class. If you can imagine millions of junior high age students supplied with a little red book of Mao's quotations, marching through the country from city to city, confronting everything old. You are old and we are young. Now is always young, but you are old, down with the olds. And they would mention four categories of old, old art, old poetry. The damage that was done was extraordinary, because there are a lot of first-hand descriptions. They would go into the museum and break every artifact they could oh. find. That's old. We're, we're new. We're new people. The tax on seniors. The what amount of the tax on seniors. The old people. The old people, too. And how they rushed certain trouble. types of institutions and actually devastated those particular enclaves and the deaths that occurred That's because right. of that. Right. But, but we were taught about the ego of the Chinese and the Russians not asking for help. And that's what helped to cause those 30 million plus. That was only from their projection then. It's supposedly even broader now. Yeah, it expanded. They were all given a little red, the little red book of Mao's quotations. And the quotations, you know, encouraged this. The country shut down for a whole year. You couldn't conduct normal business. The schools all closed. The universities, the professors had to sit in the back while the students insulted them from the front. Uh, the main target was the educational system. Many people, experts and teachers were beaten and sent away to perform manual labor. It was an ongoing revolution. People compare it to the purge trials in the Soviet Union when the Russian communists turned on their own and tried them for treason and executed many. 
But it was a war against the elites, the communist elites. And this was Mao orchestrating it all. Came back from retirement stronger than ever and using this little red book as a, a, a kind of uh, as a kind of syllabus for the ongoing revolution. You see, revolutions get stale. Even the French Revolution petered out. The Russian Revolution petered out eventually. This revolution will never get stale because it will be a continuing revolution. And he used the youth of China as his weapon against what had become another establishment, the communist establishment. No one knew what was happening. I know you saw pictures of marching youth. You all remember this, I'm sure, because this happened in the 60s. Marching youth acting crazy with their little, here's my little red book. And what is very interesting is that this uh, more or less spread. Now, I brought with me a new book which has been published within the last few months. It's called Maoism. And it's by a woman named Julia Lovell. Just, just won a prize as the outstanding history book of the year. <coughs> She begins with Edgar Snow and the popularization of what, what is called Maoism. But she describes how Mao's influence spread to the West. You can all remember back to the 60s, and do you remember the youth rebellion in the 60s? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that in Europe and America? Over there. You were, you were, you were, you were part of that all of a sudden you had these radical groups springing up, the Bader meinhof gang, the, uh, the SDS in the United yeah. States, Raise. all kinds of revolutionary groups that somehow sprang up in the United States and that eventually uh, ran riot. Mao became a hero in Europe. Remember the Mao shirts and you saw his picture everywhere. It was, it was it, suddenly Mao had become a hero of Western youth. It's a psychological phenomenon, of course. This was this this was their slogan in um, Europe. We are old. No, you are old. We are young. Mao Zedong. That was the <laughs> permeated the radical movement of the 1960s. It galvanized student protests in the United States in the mid-60s. It, uh, it also, it grew up along with other movements, feminist movements, student protest movements, gay rights movements. It legitimized urban guerrilla warfare because that's what he himself advocated. And it ultimately, as one writer puts it, it ultimately led to Reagan and Thatcher yeah. in the long run. At the Sorbonne, 1968, portraits of Mao were pinned on windows, and um, they took lessons in radicalism from the Red Guard in China. A book by Malcolm Bradbury, The History Man, 1975, a student keeps a little dog called Mao, and when the lecturer makes a reactionary mark, it's the dog nips him on the ankle. <laughs> it's called the history man. Hey. This is um, the quotes from, this is actually uh, a quote, it was a movie that was uh, made, A Fistful of Dynamite, by Sergio Leone. Do you know that name, he's Italian? director. This was the preface to the movie. The censors made him eliminate it. A revolution is not a dinner party, or writing an essay, or painting a picture, or doing embroidery. It cannot be so refined, so leisurely and gentle, courteous, restrained. A revolution is an insurrection, an act of violence by which one class overthrows another. The censors in Hollywood cut that from the film. A cult of Mao arrived in the West. Just extraordinary. At the Chicago trial of Abby Hoffman and company, now is frequently cited as a hero. Mm -hmm. The admiration for communist China undergoing this uh, 
Revolution was very widespread. And they quoted Maoisms. A single spark can create a prairie fire. These are quotes from Mao. Dare to struggle, dare to win. Whoever is not afraid of being drawn and quartered can dare to, to uh, pull the emperor from his horse. A weak nation can defeat a strong. A small nation can defeat a big. If only it dares to rise and struggle to take up arms. This is a law of history. So he became the revolutionary messiah. Mm -hmm. This is a man who was responsible for 30 million deaths. Mm -hmm. Let me read with, you. If you believe it, this is, this is almost like a psychopathic. Mm -hmm. And in the United States, it infused movements. The Black Panther movement, for example, mm -hmm. cited Mao as a hero many times. So Didn't he also say a, that power um, comes from the barrel of a gun? What is it? Didn't he also say that power comes, comes from, from the barrel, barrel of a gun? gun. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, if you don't mind, I'll just read you a little quotation from, let's see if I can find it. Oh, here it is. From Shirley MacLaine. Shirley MacLaine. <laughs> I didn't expect that. Okay. Shirley MacLaine apparently went to China during this period. She was, got a guided tour of China in 1972, and she wrote a travel memoir titled, <clears throat> You Can Go Get There From Here. <clears throat> and this is what she said. The best proof of Mao's theories was the modern Chinese people themselves. They were so open and vital. In China, we saw low food prices, streets free of crime, and drug dope peddling. Mao was a leader who seemed genuinely loved. People had great hopes for the future. Women had little need for such superficial things as frilly clothes and makeup. Children loved work. Relationships were free of jealousy, infidelity, and infidelity because monogamy was the law of the land and nobody strayed. I had a growing feeling that the Chinese way might be the way of the future. That was Shirley MacLaine. Well, a little bit. Well, that was the great cultural revolution. How did it end? Well, eventually, I guess, um, ev eventually, <coughs> more sober minds took over. Mao was again put aside. And uh, the damage that was done to the country, to the economy, to the, to the culture was enormous. And it had to come to an end. And succeeding Mao, uh, he still remained the titular head, but succeeding Mao were, uh, I guess, more realistic uh, leaders who, this is now the 1960s, begin to think in less ideological terms. It's now 1966, 67. The communist government in China it's beginning to have more trouble with the Russians. Traditional troubles. They had always fought over the Manchurian frontier. Now the Russians in the late 60s are beginning to move to reestablish the frontier to their own advantage. A great deal of friction. Mao always thought of himself as the leader of the third world. The leader of third world insurrection, the knight on the horse leading the, the minions. A lot of rivalry with the Russians. Khrushchev thought he was the leader of the third world. Mao was also thought to be stirring insurrections. His theory of revolution was extended in this way. In China, the peasantry surrounded the cities and overcame the bourgeoisie. The peasant class overcame the middle class. In the world, there are peasant continents that somehow will surround the bourgeoisie, Europe and America, Australia. These are the countries that in class terms represent the bourgeoisie. And the peasantry, Africa, Asia, these are the, uh, these are the, the continents that represent the old 
I guess, uh, peasantry, just as in China. The peasantry surrounded the cities and conquered them. So the latifundia of the world, the peasantry-based uh, continents of the world, the poor con continents, South America, uh, Asia, uh, Africa, eventually there will be a world war revolu a world war a world wide revolution that will overcome the power of the metro metropolitan areas of the world the metropolitan areas Europe America the uh, peasant uh, dominated areas Africa Asia the revolutions will come there and ultimately just as the communists in China and circled the cities, so the latifundia of the world will encircle the areas of, uh, of the United States and Europe. This was his theory, and he prided himself on his connections with, uh, I guess, the revolutionary movements in Africa, in South America, in the rest of Asia. So that became, and Khrushchev disputed that. No, no, the Russians are the leaders of the, of the uh, non-Western world. There was a great deal of rivalry between Mao and Russian leadership, and it began to lead, there were uh, sort of problems in the, uh, on the border. So it began to lead to a kind of, I guess, um, conflict between the Russians and the Chinese. They were not united any longer as one solid front. There were differences, traditional differences that had arisen, border differences, clashes, and so on. And so you now begin to get a profound shift. After the calming down of the great proletarian revolution, and after the junior high students went back to class, and the teachers came back to the classroom, after all the damage and so on, what you begin to have is a shift in Chinese thinking. And you have uh, Mao, for instance, uh, faced with this increasing competition and clashes on the borders with the Russians. What he begins to think in terms of the old way in China, if there are, if one against one, then you look for a, one, you look for a partner. You look elsewhere for help. So China, the great you know, unknown, now there's beginning to be a little split with the Russians, and now the Chinese Mao comes to the conclusion that um, in 1960 that um, the way maybe to look is to the United States. Maybe the United States will balance out the equation. This was a revolutionary thought, the United States. The United States didn't even recognize China. They, didn't, they were the support of the, um, uh, the nationalists still in Taiwan. So how could you possibly? But Mao had a strategic brain. He was one of the great, po I guess, political thinkers of the 20th century. No, he said, and he said this to a number of his, he was old and sick, but he understood the only way that you could counter the Russians was to look beyond the Russians, and where would you look? You would look to the United States. And sitting on the other side of the water was Richard Nixon, who, despite his reputation domestically, had always been an adherent of internationalism. He had been a supporter of the UN, of international treaties, and he also had a for also at, at loggerheads with the Russians. Where would you look? Maybe you would look to China. China. Why not? And so what we get in 1973, Kissinger makes a secret trip to Beijing. Secret. Is it possible, with, with the acquiescence of the communists, is it possible that if Nixon came to China, Mao would agree to see him? Mao was so far gone at the time that he needed constant injections of something to get him out of bed in the morning. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, the, it is decided that 
Nixon is desperate to end the Vietnam War. And uh, he sees this as a way of helping. And so the decision is made, Nixon will go to Beijing. Kissinger promises Mao that communist China will get the UN seat that had been occupied all that time by nationalist China. Makes that promise. And the next year, mid great secrecy, Nixon and his entourage arrive in Beijing. He is greeted at the airport by Zhou Enlai, who's long been a second in command. One minute. Has long been his second in command. Zhou Enlai greets Nixon, and he mentions to him, you know, at the Vietnam peace talks, he had gone up to John Foster Dulles and extended his hand, and John Foster Dulles had turned away and snubbed him. So he remembered that snub when he said, here you are now. They didn't know if they'd get to see Mao. I'll just make this one last point. Nixon knew that if he didn't get to see Mao, it would be a failure. I might mention that it, all this was really encouraged by the Chinese because the American, uh, you know, the, hot, the team, the ping pong team, uh, they were in a, they were in a uh, contest, with, an international contest with the Chinese, and the Chinese purposely lost to them. They would have won, but they lost. And it was followed by an invitation, a formal invitation to Beijing for the hockey, for the uh, ping pong team to come and play. Well, the ping pong team did go, and it resulted, you know, this was further than the moon, the communist China. And so there was very... Uh, I guess uh, the press coverage was very good. This was the cover that they needed. When Nixon arrived in Beijing, he was whisked away to a hotel with his entourage. They didn't know if they would get to see uh, Mao or not, but they thought the trip would be a failure if they didn't. In the middle of the night, he was awakened and said, get up, get dressed, he's going to see you now. And this awakened memories, I'll go back in history. This awakened memories, the first English uh, deputy, deputy who attempted to see the emperor in 1793 was Lord McCartney. It took him like nine months to get there. He had all these gifts, but he wanted to see the emperor. And they kept him six weeks, I think, in some villa. And then he was awakened at 4 o'clock in the morning and said, the emperor will see you now. And they stuffed him on a horse and took him to the emperor. And then he wouldn't do the koto, so it was all a waste, because he had to do a koto. Well, Nixon didn't exactly do the koto, but they kept him waiting in his hotel room, and in the middle of the night, they, they put him in a car and took him to see Mao. And what is so interesting, Mao was in terrible shape at the time. So in order to be ready to see Nixon and, and to present some reasonable appearance and cohesive talk, they had to give him all kinds of shots. His doctors had to prep him for the appearance, and they filled him full of some kind of narcotic, I guess. Uh, Nixon arrived, and he was now ready to see you. And it was a very, you know, tangential kind of talk. They really just ex exchanged pleasantries. I'm happy to meet you. It's been a long time, something like that. They didn't say very much, but that broke the ice, and that was the critical thing. And as I say, Mao was very knew a lot about American politics and what was going on here. Asked him all kinds of questions about what was happening in Congress and why he was so criticized, and all kinds of remarks that indicated he was a close follower of, the, of American life. But nevertheless, as Nixon later put it, this is the week that changed the world. I don't know if that's true or not, but um, that probably was his most important contribution. All right.